Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Three stakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Years worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito Welcome to the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. My name is Jeff Sharon. Thank you so much for joining us. Eric Lopez is with me tonight. We are recording this show early this week, Eric, because it is football season, baby. That's right, brother. We are here. Football season's here. Game week is here. And uh, we get a head start on everybody by playing on Thursday night. I know. So we, uh, well, well, we don't quite have a head start on everybody because USF actually got their head start last week. Like- and- like I said, we have a head start on programs that matter. Ah. Oh, ah. thank you. But <laughs> all right, so uh, so yeah, we're getting this up on Wednesday because uh, the game is up because the game is happening on Thursday night. UCF against FIU starting the 2017 season, and uh, we got a lot of stuff on Black and Gold Banneret uh, previewing uh, the team, previewing the game here in the next couple days. Um, we have some exciting announcements for you on a, about our game coverage that we're going to be talking about. Lots to talk about. We also had some. Uh, so we also have, we'll, we'll be talking about what's going on around the American, and we'll be checking in on our uh, UCF fantasy contest that we are having with uh, Trace and Andrew from Nightline. So that should be a lot of fun. We'll check in on that, and then we'll also talk about. Um, the uh, fall sports that also got underway this past weekend. Women's soccer's big win over North Carolina. Uh, we'll talk about volleyball's first weekend out on the road in uh, Colorado and uh, men's soccer as well. The, f- the first weekend of action under new head coach Scott Calabrese. So, uh, by the way, if you want to hear previews of those sports in case you missed them last week, make sure you te- check our feed because we did them back to back to back, those three sport previews. But uh, this show we're going to be talking about uh, we're going to be talking about football. But before we get to that, quick reminder for you: make sure you hit us up at blackandgoldbanneret dot com, where we are churning out content like mad this week. Uh, also, hit us up on our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter at uh, UCF underscore Banneret. You can also follow me on Twitter at Jeff underscore Sharon. You can follow Eric at Eric Lopez Elo, and make sure you subscribe to this podcast if you don't already. We are available on iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, Stitcher, which is uh which is humming really nicely. I'm getting good uh I'm getting good numbers on Stitcher so far since we were able to work out the feed. So thanks to the folks at Stitcher and also tune in. We're available on Tune In Radio as well. So uh all right, Elo, let's jump in. Here we go. UCF and FIU. Um the game starts uh the game's ready to kick off at Thursday on Thursday night, six PM. Remember it was scheduled for the Saturday they moved it back to the Thursday. It's at the it's at Spectrum Stadium, which is the new name of our home now because Spectrum brought out bought out Bright House Network. Uh, it is uh, going to be televised on CBS Sports Network, and UCF is favored by seventeen points. Some of the uh, storylines coming in uh, for FIU in particular. I mean, we know about all the storylines for UCF. We'll touch upon those, you know, in all the previews that we've had. But storyline for FIU, obviously, this is game number one for Butch Davis, their new head coach, who uh, has been out of coaching for the last six years. Um, last time he coached a uh, football team down in uh, South Florida, they were pretty good. That was the Miami Hurricanes um, back in the early, back in the late '90s, early 2000s. So good that they made a uh, the U Part Two documentary about it. Um, and uh, you know, I don't know if he'll have quite as much success at Florida International, but at least let's give the Panthers program some credit for um, for making a serious move after about four years of just, well, let's face it, bad football. Uh, we throttled them last year uh, in the first game that I thought with, that we were like, wow, okay, this is what the um, this is what the Scott Frost offense is supposed to look like down in Miami. Uh, that was on September 24th of last year at FIU Stadium. 
UCF beat the Panthers 53 to 14. Uh, in a game where uh, Mackenzie Milton threw for only 170 some yards, UCF ran the ball all over the place, uh, and uh, and that was that was a fun game to watch. I'm not going to lie. Actually, it was fun because actually one of my uh, one of my old students from Syracuse when I was a teaching assistant there, Matt Martucci, did play by play for BN Sports, so that was kind of cool. But uh, Milton was only eight of 14 for 173 and a touchdown. Um, UCF got touchdowns from Don Travius Wilson. Adrian Killens had a 61-yard touchdown run that was the highlight of the game uh, for the Knights, and it was it was just a steamroll. They had 501 yards of total offense, 26 first downs to FIU's 11. Uh, UCF was favored by nine in that game. This year they're favored by uh, what was it? I said earlier, 17 at home. My question to you, Eric Lopez, is: Is this game going to be an instant replay of that walkover from last year, or? Will we see a little bit more game FIU team uh, punching up in their weight class against UCF this year? Well, it's hard to say. It's the first game of the season, so there's a little bit more, you know, unknown, uncertainty. Uh, you know, I mean, even Scott Frost this week in the press conference had you know, acknowledged that, you know, you're, you're, some of this stuff is guesswork because, you know, you're, you're, Butch Davis hasn't coached at FIU. Last time he coached was when he was in North Carolina, so yeah. you're kind of – trying to figure out some tape of what they have done over in the past, but that may not necessarily, you know, they're totally different than last year's FIU team. So there's some guesswork involved there uh, being the first game of the season. Whereas, you know, last year that was during, during the season where games have already been played and you have tape and you already know who you are to some extent and who they are to some extent. Mm -hmm. So um, I think there's always nerves in that. Um, that being said, there's a reason why Butch Davis is the head coach at FIU, and then they have had their struggles uh, on that team. So, uh, you know, and I think Scott Frost, as he's mentioned too, is that they're focused on themselves and getting better internally. And I do think that there is a sense of much more confidence. And you know, coming up, well, I had a chance this week to talk to Jawan Hamilton and, and Wyatt Miller, and they both have a clear message. Uh, and and they, they, they'll talk about it in the interviews and that they 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 want to make a statement as far as what UCF football 2017 is and what they really, you know, all this talk, Jeff, about the up tempo and fast and all this and talking to players. And you'll hear it, too, in the interviews. They want to be known more as a physical football team, not necessarily a fast team or, a, you know, they want to be a physical football team. I think they know that they can run the football on teams and dominate the line of scrimmage. And I think there's a sense of optimism that their offensive line's better at this time than they were last year. They're deeper. And I think they, the players feel that they're better at this time than they were last year because they're much more comfortable with the system. Whereas last year at this time, I think they were still trying to figure out what they were doing. So um, I know it's kind of a long winded answer, but I, I do think that UCF is, will be prepared. And I think, um, FIU maybe comes out ready to go, but their shortcomings, you would think, uh, would show up. Although I know that they're certainly, you know, we could go back to two years ago when these two teams opened the season and FIU upset UCF, but that was, you know, a million years ago. But anything's that was also possible. a very different UCF club, I think. <laughs> Let's hope. Yeah, I mean, that's the hope. So, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's always uncertain, you know, nighttime. But the game being at UCF and all that will be interesting. But it'll be, it'll be interesting to see Butch uh, in person. I think that's certainly a unique storyline, considering the fact that Scott Frost played for Butch Davis when Butch was the head coach of the Cleveland Browns. Uh, Frost was there for 12 weeks. He said that he didn't really get to know Butch because he wasn't, you know, he obviously wasn't there long enough until he moved on to the next NFL team. So it's not like they they know know each other, but he did play uh, for Butch. So interesting, kind of some interesting storylines going into the game. Yeah, let's go ahead and uh, roll that interview with uh, Juwan Hamilton. Here's Eric talking to Juwan Hamilton during the uh, uh, Week One Media Day that we had uh, this past Monday. <laughs> Well, the season is here. How are you feeling here? It's finally game week. Very excited, man. Just excited to show the world, you know, what we can do this year. Tell me what you've been working on individually. Um, personally, I've been working on, you know, my tempo, slowing down when I get the ball, make sure I see the holes, and once I see it, hit it, strike right through it. You know, no dancing around like I used to do. Kind of adjust it, you know, from last year. I was a little off, you know, I was kind of running like I was still in high school instead of adjusting to the college tempo. So, you know, I can kind of say I was just working on my tempo, my 
you know, my just, you know, being patient. Who's kind of been any of the guys on the team that you've kind of talked to and kind of see for guidance? Um, well, guys like, um, you know, older guys who graduated, guys like Don Travis Wilson, who was here last yeah. year, Taz McGowan, you know, guys who had the experience before me, you know, to let me know what, you know, what I need to do come the game time. So I kind of try to put that in my toolbox and then perfect it on my own at practice. How do you feel you guys are as a group? At this point today, compared to a year ago, at this point, from a skip, you know, from learning the offense, you know, all that terminology, where you at today, to where you were, you guys were a year ago, going into that first game. Well, last year we were like, you know, it was you know it was our first year in the system, so a lot of things were. You know, off a little bit, so we had we, we was just still learning. Everything was still moving fast, you know. So the game definitely slowed down. So I feel like, you know, we know the system now. We know how everything operates, so we can actually go out there and you know do it in the game. It, it becomes easy. You got McKenzie, and of course you got the freshman quarterbacks. Uh, to tell us about them a little bit, uh, running the offense. How do you feel with how they've progressed? And McKenzie also just learning after one year. Um, all those guys, I could tell um, day by day they get comfortable and comfortable. Mackenzie, I talked to him the other day. He said yeah, he feels a lot more comfortable back there, and I could see it. And you know, he's very you know patient now. He just you know he can sit in the pocket instead of running all the time. You know, he just make a playmaker and make things happen. When uh, when people that are going to watch you play this season, what what's the thing you want people fans to know and play? You know, people that are going to be taking notice when they watch you see a football starting Thursday. Yeah, we're a very physical football team, and we're not scared of anyone. We're going to go out there and compete with anyone in the country. Well, Jeff, uh, you heard Jawan, a very confident young man, working. Talked about there about working on his game, what he what he's improving on from last year, and you heard there, and we want to be a physical football team, and uh, he's. I think he's primed for a big year. I, 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 you know, got a chance to chat with him there on Monday, and. Uh, you know, and, and it's really the strength of the football team, right? I think we would, if we had to rank all the positions on the team, Jeff, why wouldn't you say that the running back position is probably at number one, or at least right there at the top of the list of the strongest position on this team because of the quality and the depth of quality that they have in that position? Yeah, that's what I'd say is, is that the backs are certainly the deepest. Um, and the fact that they have a lot of sort of guys who are Swiss Army knives, right? Like Juwan. You know, at 5'9", 190, he's relatively small. Last year, 495 yards and four touchdowns. Uh, last year against FIU, he had only 22 yards on eight carries, but he ended up being more or less sort of the the bruiser of the whole, of the whole operation. Um, he averaged 3.6 yards per carry. You know, whereas you had the other guys out there like Adrian Killens, who were kind of the, um, like I said, the Swiss Army knives out there, who were... Um, who are out there to get big plays based on speed. Otis Anderson, they've been saying, is, some, is another guy who might very well be um, in that sort of class as, uh, as, as a sort of like positionless skill player, right? Um, you know, kind of like how you, like, I keep using this analogy, I know, but, you know, the Warriors have, the, the Golden State Warriors have play positionless basketball. Well, UCF, I think they, I think Scott Frost wants his skill guys to be like position to play positionless football where there's no guy who's a definite wide receiver or a definite running back. It's just, you know, you have your five offensive linemen, you have your quarterback, and then you have, you know, four or five guys who can line up anywhere on the field and run routes or run the football and, and do all kinds of stuff. Um, and that, that can cause havoc to defenses. So, uh, but the key for that, I think, like we mentioned earlier, Eric, is going to be the offensive line. Um, they kind of wore down. I wrote you know, on blackandgoldbanneret.com um, that you know the, the last year they the offensive line kind of broke down late in the season due to some injuries, some key injuries certainly. Um, uh, but you know this year they return uh, a, a Jordan Johnson, who was a guard last year. He moves over to center. He started almost every game at guard last year, but he's got experience up front. They return the two tackles, uh, including one guy you talked to, uh, Wyatt Miller, Eric. I did, and you know, I had a chance to talk to Wyatt about where he feels this team is at this point this year compared to last year. And really, I had really enjoyed talking to him because we go into, you know, so much focus, Jeff, on this offense is about the skill position players and the up-tempo and all that. 
And one of the things we discuss in this interview is what's it like for an offensive lineman that's about 300 pounds on, you know, some cases, if not most, to run an offense that's no huddle and up tempo. Here's my conversation with Wyatt Miller. Well, the season's here. Uh, how you feeling right now? Finally here at game week. Uh, we're excited, you know, we're excited to get on the field with um, a different opponent, you know, other than what we've been in, ugly Jamais every day. So uh, we're excited. We're um, excited to get back on the field and see, prove ourselves as far as how we've come along and how we've changed. How's your group look this year at this time compared to where it was a year ago when you guys were still learning the system? A lot of years ahead, like I said, um, the thing, the thing I think that's changed most is kind of knowing the roles of everybody else and kind of knowing how everybody affects everybody, and that could change, change us a lot of years. You know, me knowing my job is is important, but me knowing what everybody else is doing kind of helps me out doing my job. So I think I think it's going to change things a lot. The tempo, everybody talks about the tempo. Uh, uh, from your position, tell the people that may not be aware what's it like when you're going fast. The, your the responsibilities that you and your group have. Uh, it's hard being 300 pounds. Yeah. And and, uh, and running to the ball, but uh, that a lot of that a lot of the tempo falls on our shoulders as far as us getting on the ball and us making our calls and being ready when the when the wide receivers and the quarterback and whatnot get ready to snap the ball that we're ready too. So um, the tempo falls a lot on the center shoulders as far as getting on the ball, but as far as everybody else too, we, we got to sprint and get get there, kind of get down. Communication between you guys as you're going super fast. How? how how does that, you know, kind of you guys break that down? Obviously, it takes a lot of reps, but that's also very important to be successful. Yeah, um, communication is a huge part of our offense as far as getting our calls out to each other. And that goes back to, again, getting on the ball and having time to make our calls. And we've got to be loud and have different forms of communication that we use to talk to each other. So it's, it, it helps out a lot. The, the faster we get down on the ball, the better we are when we communicate. Tell me about the running backs you guys will be blocking the uh, for in a lot of cases, a lot of a lot of great talent behind that too. Yeah, we do. They make our jobs pretty easy. So when they when they hit those poles full speed or if they bounce it out, whatever they do, they make our jobs a lot easier. I mean, you know, somebody like Hamlin in the backfield or Taj McGowan, it makes us makes us feel a lot more confident. For people that are going to watch you play this season, your group play. What what would you want people to take away when they see UCF football and you guys particular play? We're a tough group. Um, toughness is a, is a big thing to me. I I take a lot of pride in being tough and uh, that's what I when somebody watches our offense line and they take away that we're tough then I feel like we've, uh, we've done our job. Yeah interesting and, I, and I've said this before uh, Eric that you know the, the key to the speed of the offense is the offensive line because you know it, it's it's a constant go 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 type offense where you know even when the play is over you have to be you're, you're still basically running around and getting downfield quickly. And the key to that is the offensive lineman. They want to get downfield, get lined up quickly within 10 seconds of the, uh, of the play clock starting so that the defense can barely catch up. Then they can't make a call. They're running some sort of vanilla base scheme, and then you can really pick them apart. So um, I always thought that that was going to be an adjustment for the offensive line that was that in terms of having Scott Frost here is going to take a couple years to really get like the right kinds of guys. Um, but, Having that experience back this year with the two tackles in the center um, is going to be, uh, I think, is going to be a big boost to UCF. A um, little concerned about the guard position. I think everyone uh, was, including Scott Frost. He said that on Media Day back last week. But yeah, I, I do feel that the offensive line is actually primed to have a very solid season um, right now. What do you think based on you know coming off of your conversation with Wyatt and, and knowing what you know coming out? Well, I think the, the thing I've heard is that they have more depth than they did last year, that there's consistency that you know, they feel confident about that, where they didn't have that last year. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, you notice again what Wyatt said. I asked him, and that is, you heard, what do you want people to know? Are the people are going to be watching you play, watch your team, your group play? What do they want to, what, what do they want to, what do you want them to have a takeaway from? And he's like, we want them, we want them to know that the, we're a physical football team. And I, I think they've taken that really uh, 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 to heart. I never heard that last year, for example, in comparison. I think last year it was more of, well, we're fast. We're going to be fast. We're going to see fast. Right. You heard all of that. Whereas this time around, I'm hearing about physicality and I like it because, you know, again, I think it's interesting. There's the perception is every time you mention no huddles and spread offenses and all that, you just assume that it's passing offense and it's this and that. 
Not necessarily. And, I, and I've said this again with Scott Frost in Oregon. Oregon's, a, I think a lot of people have the wrong idea of Oregon that don't follow the foot, the sport closely enough. It's yes, it's an up tempo, wide open offense, but it's not a uh, throw it 50 times a, a, a game offense. Right. It's an offense that, that runs the football and then sets up the pass because you're, you're gashing defenses and you're trying to wear them down and then you set up the play action passes. So, uh, look, I think this team, if they're going to be successful this season, it's going to be not necessarily because of the quarterback per se, but it's how well they run the football. If you go back to last season when they struggled and lost, for example, the Temple game that jumps to my mind, why? Well, because they struggled in the second half to move the football because they couldn't run the football. And so as a result, they, they had a lot of short possessions and their defense was on the field a lot and got worn out. And I think that's, you know, to me, this team needs to be consistently running the football. And then that will make the job easier for McKenzie Milton in the passing game. Uh, I, I think for, for yeah, that's to me the key for this offense in 2017 because they have the strengths of the backfield. You mentioned Anderson. I've heard a lot of great things about Anderson. You've got Jawan. You've got talent. In, but I, I sense with this offensive line that there's a confidence there that there was not last year in part because of the depth uh, in quality there. And I think because they, un they're, they're, they're much more comfortable in what they're doing now, whether it be verbal communication and, and tempo than they were a year ago when they were still trying to figure all that out. Yeah. One key that I wanted to point out too, uh, in particular, when we think about this, you know, well, it's no longer a new offense. We've had it for a year now. Um, I always like to go back and look at Marcus Mariota's stats at Oregon. And this was an interesting thing that I, that I, that I was able to dig up. You look at his uh, his first year as the starter at Oregon. It was 2012. He was a sophomore. Oregon lost one game that year as against Stanford. He threw 37 passes in the game. That was his highest pass attempt total of the entire season. It was 37. Uh, he's uh, in this in the following year, in 2013. Oregon lost two games. Uh, in those two games, uh, or, or those two games he lost, he threw 41 and 34 passes. Those were his highest total for attempts, and tied for his, and, and tied for his second highest total in attempts. And then in 2015, uh, 2014, rather, um, the year that they lost to Ohio State in the national title game, uh, the two games that they lost, he attempted 32 and 37 passes. He never only once in his Oregon career, once. Did he attempt 40 passes in a game? Now, I think that if you walked up to somebody on the street who knew about college football and you, and you asked, you know, quick, how many passes a game did Marcus Mariota throw, throw at Oregon in Scott Frost's offense, they would say, oh, he threw at least 40 passes a game, sometimes 50. Mm-mm, not the case. Never threw more than 41 passes in a game. And the more, and the more times he threw, the less likely it was that Oregon won. So you're right. This is a this is a running offense. Um, it's not a ball control offense, but it is a running offense, um, and that may be. Uh, hopefully, that'll provide UCF with a real advantage, and we'll see this offense really start working. Go ahead. The only thing I'll disagree. The only thing I'll disagree with you said it's not a new offense anymore, but in some ways it still is. Because remember. This is only the second season. There's still a lot of players on this roster from the previous regime that were brought in to play a pro set offense. That's true. So, so a, a lot of these players, you know, and, and for you know, people might say, "Well, what's the difference?" Well, I mean, it's kind of like different languages. It's kind of like, you know, you go from, uh, you know, you go to, a, you know, you're you're hanging out in the states and you're speaking English, and then all of a sudden you're in France and you got to figure out how to speak French. So. There, you know, some of these guys weren't brought in to run a spread offense. They're used to a pro set offense. So um, that's still the question is, you know, a lot of the guys that Scott Frost has brought in either are true sophomores or, or true freshmen, really. Uh, maybe in some cases, redshirt freshmen. So those are still the young guys that know the system, maybe. Uh, whereas the veterans, they might know the terminology now. They might know, like, I'll go continue my analogy. Maybe they went to France and know how to speak French, but do they speak it fluid? Mm -hmm. We don't know. We won't know that yet. That's one of the interesting thing plot lines this year. They might know the system better, but can they still can they execute it better? And that's 
one of the be- the keys for this season is how further of advanced are some of these guys are, or will there still be some hiccups, which I think there will be um, throughout the season, and how they overcome that. On the other side of the ball uh, for FIU, um, two guys that uh, UCF's defense is going to have to deal with. Obviously, uh, their quarterback returns. It's Alex Magoo, 6'3", 218. Uh, last year against UCF, uh, he had a completely horrible game. He was uh, only 5 of 9 uh, for 68 yards and a touchdown. Um, but people remember him not so much for that performance against UCF as much as they do uh, for uh, his performance in the opener in 2015. That was our 0-15 year when he uh, he was, to be honest with you, outstanding, 29-38 two hundred sixty yards and a touchdown uh in FIU's upset of UCF in the season opener um at then Bright House Network Stadium, now known as uh Spectrum uh Stadium as well. So there's that to deal with. Uh their new offensive coordinator is Rich Skorsky. Uh and he has uh, coming back after two consecutive years with season ending knee injuries, a running back by the name of Alex Gardner, who's a fourth year starter but had the last two seasons um, you know, peter out due to due to some season ending uh injuries 930 yards and six touchdowns last season also caught 30 balls out of the backfield Uh, but their offensive line is not very good magoo knows that better than anyone based on last year's performance um so that's something that i think the ucf defense is going to have to contend with uh, and and again you know like we've said before we're running into a situation where you've got a quarterback that you've seen before but a coach and a scheme that you haven't because Butch Davis has, you know, it's not like you have any recent tape on Butch Davis. He's been, um, uh, he, he hasn't been in, co- in, in coaching in uh, six years. Um, Skorsky on the other hand, I got to look up where he was before, but um, he does have a couple of weapons that you can deal with. He does, but uh, I got to tell you, I have gotten more and more confident about this defense as the season's gotten closer. And I don't you know, maybe... You know, you know, you obviously look when you talk to players and coaches, everything's going to be positive for the most part. So certainly maybe that influences to some extent. But uh, I got to tell you, everybody I've talked to feels that this defense is actually better than last year. Um, That's a pretty good defense last year. We, we've seen the numbers. Yeah. I mean, the defensive front basically returns. They have depth in the defensive line. They have put pressure there. Uh, you know, you, you certainly got Shaq Griffin back. Yes, you. I think the question, if you're going to question the defense, maybe a little bit is the secondary a little bit, it's particular in the cornerback spot, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, which could you know could come in play when we get into conference play and you're playing some of these offenses. But um, and certainly you use you lose Shaquille Griffin to the NFL to Seattle and safety questions there. But a lot of these young guys that were backups uh, know the system and they're very athletic. And you and I actually got a chance back at media day, which was a couple weeks ago to talk to Trey Neal. And, and remember, you remember what Trey told us? You remember what he told us about the defense and, and the confidence where they're at today than they were a year ago. Much more confident. Um, yes. Yeah. You know, Trey. Well, I mean, you know, confidence is one thing. I mean, I, I think we both know Trey is never short on confidence and nor does he have any no. reason to be because I mean, you know, Trey, Trey, I think by the end of the year, he's going to be a household name. Uh, here for you, uh, you know, for for UCF fans, I get a little worried about the corner spot because you do have one redshirt freshman who's going to be starting out there, um, and that is always something that's going to be uh, but, that's going that's going to scare the the daylights out of people. It's uh, uh, Brandon Moore, who's uh, from Seminole High School. He's going to be out there, but um, it, that that being the case, I think that that may work out because if these guys are if these guys are as good as they say they are, right? And yeah. a, an experienced quarterback like Magoo is going to try and test him. That opens the that opens up for UCF's defense. I think a lot of opportunities to make some big plays. Well, and I've seen more, by the way, in person at Seminole when I was, uh, I think it was two years ago at a playoff game. I was working uh, statistician work for uh, at the time Bright House Sports Network. It's now Spectrum Sports, and he was uh, he was impressive from an athletic ability. But here's the thing: you know how you protect the cornerback. If get you the put pass, a pass rush. rush, yep. 
if the, if the defensive line and if they dominate and put pressure on the quarterback, that's going to make the cornerback look really good because the quarterback's not going to have a lot of time to throw and, and expose the corner. As you know, if the, if there's no pass rush, I don't care how good of a corner you are. If if you got to cover some receivers for four, five, six seconds, you're going to be in trouble. So I think it goes back to the line of scrimmage and the defensive line, and I think that will allow the young secondary or you know, the corners there to maybe gonna get their feet wet and experience. Now that could become an issue the following week when we have Memphis, which might be arguably the best offense in the league coming back, but we'll get into that down the road. As far as this week at FIU, I think that that's to me, that's where I think UCF's going to dominate FIU's dominate that line of scrimmage. And I think you're going to force some turnovers. Well, that's certainly the hope. And FIU's uh, offensive line last year was bad. How improved are they? We don't know. We're going to find out. So, uh, all right. So, real quick, UCF favored by 17. What's your prediction? Oh, I'll say they win. And, uh, yeah, sure. I'll say uh, I, I don't, I don't, you're, you're into that whole point spread. You're like, uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, you're like the you know the the late uh, who was the 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 Greek? You're like Jimmy, Jimmy the, Greek? the Greek. Oh boy. Yeah. So are you like Jeff the Greek? No, I mean, uh, <laughs> no, I'm Italian. <laughs> so Jeff the Italian? Can we go with that? <laughs> Jeff the Italian? Then you're you're you know I don't know if that's PC anymore. How did Jimmy? I mean that's a whole other story. How did Jimmy the Greek get allowed to be called Jimmy the Greek back then? Probably wouldn't have been allowed in today's PC world, but whatever. <laughs> um, I, I will say that UCF wins by more than that. I. Two, believe that UCF will win and cover. I don't think they will be as dominant as they were last year. It won't be a 53-14. Remember what happened in that game? I, I, you know, last year was, the, the, I think that night, FIU fired their head coach. They did, yes. Uh, Ron Turner. Ron Turner, uh, that's was, right. The, former head coach day, of Illinois. I think, the next day. I think it was the next day they fired him, and uh, that was his last game as the coach at FIU. So, right. Uh, um, that I don't think no that's going to happen this time. No, 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 no. <laughs> and I, for whatever it's worth, I mean, I, I think Butch, uh, I think he'll do well at FIU. I, I, the guy, he can recruit. He can knows that area. They'll get players. I, I, I think he'll turn that program around into a bowl team. Um, you know, it'll be interesting because obviously FAU with Lane Kiffin, they have the better facilities. Interestingly, uh, as of at the, as of now, to our awareness, this is the last game scheduled between UCF and FIU. FAU will play UCF coming up here, so um, yeah. it's kind of interesting to see how that will go and how Lane Kiffin does at FAU and how Butch will do. And it's interesting because it's kind of a contrast. Lane has made a lot of noise um, on and off the field. Uh, whereas Butch has kind of been quiet since he's been there at FIU. Nothing's too earth shattering. So very interesting styles there. And it'll be interesting how they're who's successful and who's not successful. Or maybe they're both successful. That that'll be fascinating. Well, for the sake of, you know, college football in the state of Florida, I I do hope that they're both successful because I, I, I think it would be fun to see. It, it, well, if you had to bet money, if you're betting money, if yeah. you bet money today, Jeff, the Italian. <laughs> uh, uh, that's going to be your new nickname when we <laughs> get into that. Um, I feel like I should. I, I feel like I should be like you know, change my name to like Vinny or something. You know, if, if we're going to do these th- these kinds of things. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you could pick one, do you think will, you're more confident will be more successful? Are you going with Lane Kiffin and FAU, who does have their own stadium and facilities and things like that, or do you go with Butch Davis and FIU? I'm going with FIU because let's not forget they have their own stadium too. It's a little bit more of an erector set than FAU, but they do play on campus. Um, I, I just, as someone who grew up a University of Miami fan, I have, um, I guess, a, a, a special place in my heart for Butch Davis, and I know what he's certainly capable of and what he has done down in South Florida. He's a familiar site to um, a lot of the a lot of the South Florida football community. If you're going to succeed at FIU, you're going to have to get those kids that, you know, that that not just the the top level Florida schools passed on, but also, you know, other out of state schools passed on, too. So these are, you know, these are kids that Florida, Florida State, Miami, UCF and USF were both like, nah, no thanks. And, you know, when you find when you're looking for guys like that in South Florida high schools, um you could you could find yourself some real diamonds in the rough, especially when you got a kid who's talented. First of all, 
than the average bear and has a chip on his shoulder. I think Butch knows how to play that pretty darn well. So uh, I, I hope uh, Butch has uh, great success at FIU, just, you know, not on Thursday night. So, all right, let's, uh, uh, let's take a look around the American real quick uh, of what's going on. First of all, uh, obviously, we're playing uh, on uh, Thursday night, uh, and we're not the only uh, team playing on Thursday night in the American that you can check out. Uh, by the way, the game, 6 p.m. kick on, uh, on CBS Sports Network. Um, if you're at home, you can switch over, uh, switch around a little bit. Uh, Cincinnati is opening their season against Austin P at 7 p.m. on Thursday. That's on ESPN3. Uh, UConn opens up with Holy Cross. In Hartford, that game's on ESPN three or SNY if you if you get that channel from up in New York. Uh, and also uh, another one on uh, Thursday is what? Well, look at these games on Thursday: Oklahoma State uh, and Tulsa. That game's at Stillwater. Uh, that's on FS one seven thirty p.m. And Memphis opens up their season, of course, at nine o'clock on CBS Sports Network, playing Louisiana Monroe. That's at Memphis. So that's a doubleheader on CBS Sports Network on Thursday night of American Athletic Conference football. UCF against FIU, followed by ULM against Memphis. Uh, Navy opens up with Florida Atlantic down in Boca Raton. That's on uh, Friday night at 8 p.m. Saturday, uh, Temple heads to Notre Dame. That's a big opener there. That game will be on NBC uh, at 3.30 p.m. on Saturday. By the way, that FAU Navy game on Friday night is going to be on ESPNU, so that's nationally televised. Uh, also on uh, going back to Saturday, like we mentioned, Temple at Notre Dame on NBC three thirty. Uh, USF plays Stony Brook uh, in Tampa. That's on ESPN three at four p.m. on Saturday. East Carolina faces James Madison at home on ESPN three at six. And uh, let's see what else we got. SMU and Stephen F. Austin on ESPN three. Uh, in Dallas, and Tulane takes on Grambling in New Orleans on ESPN3. That's at 8 p.m., so that's your American Athletic Conference rundown. By the way, um, USF, by the way, of course, they started their season, started a little slow against uh, San Jose State, um, but picked it up and uh, ended up knocking off the Spartans, so that was uh, 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 Charlie Strong's first win at USF. So they got a little bit of a head start uh, on us on that as well. Uh, and then also, um, uh, so yeah, that's how that's how the American shapes up uh, right now. So one last thing we wanted to get to before we take a break. Uh, Got to check in on our UCF fantasy here. Uh, it's re- remember, folks. This is uh, if you listen to the Nightline podcast, you know this. But if you don't, and you listen to us, first of all, great. Second of all. This is how this works. We got a little friendly competition here, fantasy football competition going on between us here at the Black and Gold Banneret and uh, Trace and Andrew with the Nightline Podcast. What we're doing every week is we are picking each of our little establishments are picking one offensive player and one defensive player and facing off in a sort of fantasy competition. The rules are you get uh, – one point on offense, you get one point for every 10 yards rushing or receiving. Quarterbacks don't count except for rushing and receiving yards. So if you could pick a quarterback, but you're only getting the rushing and receiving yards. You get five points for a touchdown. On defense, you get a point for a tackle, five points for uh, some kind of turnover or a sack. So a, f- so a force fumble, sack, or interception. So just to update you, uh, we had the first pick. We picked... Um, who do we pick? We picked Juwan. Uh, we picked Juwan Hamilton for our offensive player, right? And that's not why I interviewed him. Just for the record, <laughs> that just happened. We, we picked. I didn't, and I did not. I didn't encourage him. Hey, listen, make sure you get a touch. I didn't do any of that. No, 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 we don't do that. We don't do that. We, but we did. But we did pick for. Uh, we did. We picked Juwan, and we picked yep. Trey Neal for our defensive player, and uh, Trace and uh, Andrew. Uh, selected uh, Shaquem Griffin and Traquan Smith. Uh, so Shaquem's their defensive player. Shaquem, uh, Traquan, obviously, their offensive player. So, uh, so we'll see how this goes. We'll see. We'll be following the competition with them throughout the uh, throughout the season. Absolutely, a little friendly contest and between between the two of us. Absolutely. And as I told, Tra- you know, I'll tell Trace, look. Don't take it personally. Finishing second every week, it's okay. <laughs> and the good news is, second's not all that news- bad, you know. 
Well, and the good news with, with Trace is he's a season ticket holder for Orlando City, so he's accustomed to seeing lo- losing results and good efforts but losses. So he'll, you know, this will fit in right nicely. <laughs> All right, we'll leave it at that. All right, stick around when we return from this quick timeout. Uh, we will talk about uh, women's soccer and their big win over North Carolina uh, uh, in double overtime the other night. We'll also, and by uh, the way, yeah. I will say this too, Andrew. Well, he played football at Kansas, so do I need to say anything more about losses and being used to losing? That's all I mean. That's all. He's, he's just driving the knife a little bit deeper with each little thing. All right, so we'll get back to that. Uh, we'll talk about women's soccer and volleyball and men's soccer coming up here in just a little bit. Stick around. The Black and Gold Bagnerette podcast is back after this. Hello, Night Nation. I'm Andrew Fegley. And I'm Trey Strelko. Um, uh, um, where are we? This isn't our usual spot. It looks like we've landed in the Black and Gold Banneret podcast. Oh, yeah. I've, I've heard of those guys. You know, Nightline has UCF sports covered. Week in and week out, we bring you interviews with newsmakers and in-depth analysis of UCF sports. Subscribe to our weekly podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to subscribe to Nightline on YouTube, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter at UCF underscore Nightline. Trace, can we go back to the 1148 studios now and start working on our next all-new Nightline? How do we get out of here? Go Knights! Charge on. Now back to you guys in the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. All right, and uh, welcome back. And oh, by the way, you know, congrats to uh, Trace and Andrew for doing that. They're doing their post-game show uh, after the yes. game at Burger U. So make sure if you get the chance... Uh, to check that out. Also, uh, one other thing I wanted to get out there. Um, the uh, American Athletic Conference uh, is uh, uh, has announced that it will make a $100,000 donation to the American Red Cross to support rescue and recovery and rebuilding efforts uh, in Houston. Of course, uh, Hurricane Harvey uh, smashing into uh, coastal Texas uh, and just the flooding in Houston, I, I mean, if, if you haven't seen it yet, I mean, first of all, you've been living under a rock. It is, it is absolutely catastrophic in Houston. Uh, we're talking record amounts of rainfall. It's not over yet over there. We're, they're only, um, we're, we're only in the thick of it right now. So our, our good friends at the University of Houston uh, and the guys at the podcast, we've ch- I checked in with them earlier this week. They're doing fine. Um, but uh, the city of Houston needs our help. So uh, you make sure you visit uh, redcross.org, call 1-800-RED-CROSS, or text the word HARVEY, H-A-R-V-E-Y, to 90999, and you'll make a $10 donation to the American uh, Red Cross. So our, our thoughts and our hearts go out to our friends at the University of Houston and all the fans out there. Uh, in uh, in H Town as well, and all the UCF Knights out there who maybe who who've found their professional lives uh, moved out to Houston. Uh, it's going to be a very very long and arduous process uh, of uh, of recovery and cleaning up uh, from the devastation that this you know that this one in a thousand year flood is uh, is has brought to um, to the Houston area. So one of the largest populated areas in the country. So. Um, please, if you can, if you can spare uh, a little bit to donate, our friends in Houston need your help. So, uh, so please look out for them on that. Um, all right, let's talk uh, about. Well, I thought this was the big story coming out as we uh, dive back in. Jeff Sharon, Eric Lopez, with you. Follow us at UCF underscore Banneret on Twitter, Black and Gold Banneret dot com, and Black and Gold Banneret on Facebook. Um, we've got. Uh, let's let's dive into women's soccer here, Eric, because. What a moment. What a moment to start the season for uh, the Knights. They had that one-on-one road trip to start the season up in, uh, up in South Carolina at home against Stetson. Come in, face number four, North Carolina. Okay, this is North Carolina women's soccer. This is Mia Hamm. This is Tiffany roberts her, her, uh, herself played at North Carolina, won two national championships. Anson Dorrance, head coach. This is the New York Yankees of Women's college soccer coming into UCF. A little bit of history going back to 1982 when UCF was a national finalist with Michelle Akers. North Carolina knocked them off back then. Coming into this game, we both were at this game, Eric. Just describe for us what happened in this game because this will go down as one of the great moments. Uh, it's definitely one of the great moments in UCF soccer history, maybe one of the great moments in school history. 
Well, look, it was a height mid-range. I mean, North Carolina, you mentioned it's the pre the, the the most successful soccer program in women's soccer program, heck, and any even including men program in, in the NCAA. And yeah, go look how go look up how many national championships that they've won. We'll wait. <laughs> with one of the greatest coaches in the history of all of college athletics, uh in the sideline for North Carolina. So you you know you have rain kind of before the game and you're wondering, geez, is that gonna affect the crowd? And the answer was no, there was a good crowd, great turnout, good turnout, uh great support from the administration. You had the UCF basketball team there, Johnny Dawkins, the head coach, was there. Mm-hmm. You had the UCF women's basketball team there. You had uh coach Abe there. Yep. Uh you had Becky Kramer, who you got a chance to talk to, the rowing coach of the uh, the American Conference champions. She was there. And a lot uh, of the players, other athletes were there. Saw yes. a lot of football players there were hanging out. It was great to see. Great to see. I really uh was tremendous turnout, but yet a couple minutes into the match, North Carolina gets a quick go. And remember, we had we talked about this last week because North Carolina is a team that will attack you and attack you and attack you right away. And they did that. And they scored quickly a couple minutes in, and you're like, uh-oh. <laughs> like, uh-oh. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> Carol- yeah, that's what we were thinking. Oh, boy. Carolina just showed up. They did. And now – because now the problem is uh, – you know, and I'll go soccer on you. Now if you see – you've got to respond. You've got to attack. But by attacking, you open yourself up to a counterattack, which Carolina is tremendous at. Uh, so now you're thinking, boy, this could be a long, long night. But no, UCF responded. They matched the play of UC of North Carolina. They were able to equalize the, the match with a goal later in the first half to even it up at 1-1. And it was a back-and-forth match. It's one of the better uh, women's soccer matches that I've seen in person. You know, and, you know, it, again – and real high level quality soccer in which you would expect with Anson Dorrance, who I mentioned is the head coach at North Carolina, one of the all time greats, uh, not in not just women's soccer, but of all sports. When you have to consider the impact that he's had on that sport and on a many, many, many players. And forgive including- me for interrupting, by the way, how good is Anson Dorrance over a 20 year span from 1981 to 2000? Anson Dorrance in the North Carolina Tar Heels won 17 national titles. 17 national good. titles in 20 years. That's amazing. I mean, Nick Saban can't even do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, not even Gino that much, although Gino's yeah. close. But so back and forth match. Now, Carolina got a goal late in the second half. I remember you and I were there like, oh, but it turned out she was offsides. Thankfully, right. uh, it was just a late call, but it was offsides call. And, you know, they get to overtime. Fascinating. Coach Sahadek switching the goalies which is fascinating. We'll hear from Coach Sahedek about that late and shortly. But uh, And then they hit it. They get the goal. In the, you know, and, I'm, and I'll be honest. I'm thinking, boy, let's just get a draw, and I'll be thrilled. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm like, let's just get a draw. But guess what? The great thing about it is UCF didn't think that way, thankfully. Uh, they were attacking. And, again, we talked with uh, Coach Sahedek last week and on the women's soccer preview. I know you played it about how they feel they have a lot of different options from an offensive standpoint, and that's what's kind of been proven correctly so far, and it paid off. If they got a great shot there to win it in the second overtime and pull out a, an amazing scene, uh, celebration, uh, jubilation, uh, just amazing. And, you know, we were I was there for the postgame, and Coach said, hey, I've never seen such an a – uh, such an emotional, incredible postgame for her because it meant a lot for her, obviously. She played – at North Carolina, that's the school. That's the coach that's had one of the biggest impacts in her life in a lot of ways. She became the first former player to beat Anson Dorrance, by the way. And he's had plenty. Um, yep. And she mentioned, and you'll hear it on the clip, Anson Dorrance, after the match when he's congratulated her, he said that your team played like you did for me. Honestly, is I love my team. Like, they have amazing senior leadership right now there is no ego on this team they all understand their roles and they're all in it for each other and I just really feel like when it comes down to the grind and it you need to rely on that you know um you know Carolina is always a very very good team and a dynasty and they have an aura about them that sometimes it's just hard to beat overcome the aura and I was just so proud of them to come out with the confidence and know that that we can do it tonight. So they, they had that belief and they had the leadership and the chemistry and uh, no ego. I mean, 
a lot of pieces to that success. My team, I was telling my team, you know, as a player, I've been through some amazing championships and a World Cup and Olympics, and uh, I have amazing experiences winning at the highest level. But it's so satisfying as a coach to watch your players. Like, this win stacks up, and I think it even, I know people won't believe me when I say this, but the feeling of this win tonight even feels stronger than winning a World Cup. Because just being in a coach position and watching your team, it's like you're a parent. You know, you're just so excited for your players. So it, it's huge. Well, RPI, it should give us a huge boost. Um, and that's why we play these games, because there's really no, there's no risk. If you lose the game, it's not going to hurt you at all. And, uh, but the, the reward is huge. And so um, to come out on top is great for RPI, but the season's not over, and we have to take care of all the games. So the games you're supposed to win, we better win, you know. And so I gotta, my job is to uh, get the team to come down from this uh, emotional high right now and get back on track and uh, take care of business with every opponent. So that's going to be my job just to kind of bring them back together and, and get to business. He's a mentor of mine. He's, he is, he's like the god of soccer and so like I feel like I'm one of his you know disciples you know <laughs> I'm like I I grew up playing for him you know not just on for Carolina but for the for the national team too he was my first national team coach so he um, taught me about competitiveness so in a way his own teachings that were instilled in me beat him he said that uh, my players played like me so, which was a huge, that just gave me goosebumps. But that, that's just, that is the best compliment that I can get because Anson always said that my best quality was playing with my heart. And he saw that in my team tonight. So that was the best compliment I can get. Well, that was, uh, I mean, you talk about an emotional win. That, it, it doesn't get much more uh, emotional than that, especially for Tiff, who, uh, you know, certainly I think, you know, I said I wrote this in our recap of the game, certainly her signature win here at UCF. Uh, Christine Creighton, the senior who got the game winning goal, uh, was uh, she um, uh, was named offensive player of the week in the American. Uh, and the player who got the other goal for UCF, uh, Dina Orshman, who had that critical goal, like you said, uh, scored, scored on her first and only shot of the game. Um, uh, she's a freshman. She actually just came back from Germany where they were, I think at the U 23s. Uh, and, uh, and Dina actually, uh, was named rookie of the week. And, uh, how about that for a, for a double dip there for UCF? But I'll look back at this, Eric. I made this point earlier in that column that I wrote. Th this really did seem like uh history kind of repeating itself almost because it was eight years ago that UCF women's soccer faced a number four team in the country at home from the ACC and defeated them in a golden goal in double overtime. And that was against Florida State eight years ago. Amanda Cromwell's team um, defeated uh, Florida State at the UCF soccer complex. Um, this was before we had the grandstands built and all that. It was on a, on a free kick from Becca Thomas. She found Courtney Whitten in front of the net and, Courtney headed it in and, and gave UCF a one to nothing win over FSU. Uh, certainly a huge win for the program uh, and for that then was a head great coach. Match in itself, it too. really Another was, great. yeah. Very similar, yeah. And it was uh, a, 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 certainly a signature win for Amanda Cromwell. Um, and then, but but this game against North Carolina, this is th this is this is beating UCLA basketball in the '60s. This is this is certainly her signature win, and and you you got it from the the soundbite the soundbites that we had from her after the match that, uh, you know, how um, emotional it was and what a springboard it is for the well, program, too, to beat North Carolina. And as you acknowledge in the audio, some of the audio highlights you played there, it's one of the, it's the biggest win of her career and one of her favorites. I mean, it's it's right there. I mean, it's, a, it's just going to go down. You know, she's had some great wins as a player, obviously, which is well documented, but this is going to be right up there. I mean, it meant a lot. And you're right, it's a significant win because, obviously, look, you missed the NCAA tournament last year. There's questions, okay. What a what a big, big win to put yourself on the map. I mean, this was the story across all of the soccer world. It was on NCAA.com. 
And it's a big statement win um, to to say, hey, that we're around. And, you know, UCF's, you know, one of the great programs in women's soccer of all time. I had this conversation in the stands with some of the people. And then actually with Trace from, from Nightline, we have actually talked about that because Trace and I are big soccer fans. And I've always said, Jeff, all right, I've always said this. When it comes to women's sports, I've always felt that UCF is a women's soccer school. It's always been number one from a tradition standpoint, from an interest standpoint, from a success standpoint, from whatever you want to say. Women's soccer has been the program when it comes to women's sports, and I've always put it as number one. Mm-hmm. But when you put it in that regard, when I mean, you have one of the greatest female athletes in the history of not just soccer, but in a lot of the women's sports, and Michelle Akers uh, played at UCF and things like that. So there's tremendous tradition. There's tremendous expectations. I would say that of all the teams, there's a lot. I don't think, in my opinion, in, in, a, in excluding the football program for obvious reasons and men's basketball and all that, I think the women's soccer coach is a, probably the, the has the most pressure of all the, the sports at UCF, not including yeah. football, men's basketball, baseball, because of the tradition that it has. Yeah, there's tremendous and I, tradition, and, and, it, and it goes back to, you know, like you said, Michelle Lakers. But, you know, when I think of UCF women's soccer, you know, what other program in the country, maybe maybe North Carolina, maybe Virginia, but what other program in the country is as closely tied to the United States women's national team? as UCF is. Consider that you know, Michelle Akers played here. Um, and then the last two head coaches, Amanda Cromwell and uh, and Tiffany robertson Hadak, both former members of Team USA. And, uh, and and that has, I think, staying power with, certainly with recruits. Um, but yeah, that put, there's a lot of pressure associated with that. And high expectations because of it. And so that's what's a big win. It's a significant win. Uh, get him, you know, and and look, the two programs played, I think, in one of the first ever national championship games in women's soccer in 1982. 1982, uh, that's right. Uh, Megan Herberth, uh, Herboth, the uh, SID at UCF women's soccer, wrote about it uh, leading up to the game. Michelle Aker, you know, and so there's a lot of uh, history and and tradition, and that's a huge win uh, for a platform. But they can't rest on that win, and that's going to be the challenge now, Jeff. They're going out west. They're going to play the Pac-12 schools, Arizona and Arizona State. One thing that was smart, by the way, I I thought, it, and I don't know if it was by design or not. I didn't get a chance to ask, Coach. They didn't play a game on the weekend after North Carolina, and I think that was smart because that was going to be an emotional letdown no matter what mm-hmm. if you would have played a game on Sunday. I don't know if it was by design or not by design, but I do like that fact. But now they got to head out west, and they and they got to you know put that behind them, and you know you know not rest on their laurels. They got still work to do, and you want what you want to do is use that win and build on that win, and really, uh, 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 you know, take it to the to the next level. And I think that's what we're hoping to see. But it won't be easy because they got to go out west, and you got to go against two Pac-12 programs like Arizona and Arizona State. And uh, as we you know with our good friend Amanda Cromwell, coaches at UCLA, and we we had her on in the summer. We talked about the. You know, that West Coast and the Pac-12 there, it's not an easy league. It's a tough league. And so it'll be another challenge for Coach Sahadak, an opportunity, though, on the road and see how this team handles now the success and people patting you on the back and, hey, you're doing great. How see how they handle that out West. Yeah. So that'll be big for them coming up uh, this coming up this coming week. And uh, we'll be seeing that again, like you mentioned, Arizona, Arizona State, two Pac-12 teams, the heat out there in Arizona. It's going to be a big challenge coming off that emotional win. How do you handle? How do you handle it after that? That's always a big question. How do you handle success? Uh, it's one thing to handle failure. Handling success is another thing entirely. So we'll be watching out for that. We will be also watching out for UCF men's soccer. Uh, they had their season opening trip up to Durham, North Carolina, uh, last weekend. They played Duke on Friday. Uh, 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 Came up short in uh, head coach Scott Calabrese's first uh, game at UCF, two to nothing, and then they and then uh, the Knights also on Sunday stayed up in Durham, faced Elon, and uh, lost that game one to nothing as well. But there is a little home cooking in store Friday, September the first, seven p.m. at the UCF Track and Soccer Complex. Day after the football game, obviously UCF takes on Charlotte in the home opener for uh, coach uh, for Coach Calabrese's team. Coach Calabrese's is first home game, obviously, so um, that'll be big. That game is uh, scheduled to be on UCFnights.tv, but 
I think it would be good. Uh, I think it would be pretty, uh, pretty, bo- a pretty good boost for the program to get folks out there to uh, uh, to see the UCF men's team and Coach Calabrese out there w- with his uh, first home opener. So uh, bear that in mind as the Knights try to get their first win of the regular season. Remember, they were two and zero in the preseason volleyball. They started their season out at the University of North Colorado Bears and Colorado State University Rams Classic. This is a tournament that was basically split between Northern Colorado in Greeley and Colorado State in Fort Collins. Uh, and the Knights went five sets. I mean, can you imagine? They're in they're, they're, First of all, you're up in Denver, basically, mile high, and they go five sets in all three matches. Uh, beat Northern Colorado. Uh, but lost to Duke, 15-8 in the fifth, and then, uh, or, excuse me, they uh, went to four with Colorado State. They didn't go five, they went to four with Colorado State. Um, but still, five, five, and four in that environment, the Knights come out of there one and two. Um, and, you know, Northern Colorado, I think that was expected, although they're a pretty good mid-major squad. Uh, Duke is Duke, of course, but um, Colorado State, you know, they had a pretty high RPI last year, so... Um, nice go fo- go four with them, but can't uh, but uh, but lost their basically rubber game of the tournament. They come back to the Sunshine State, but they're still on the road this week for the Homewood Suites Sunshine State Challenge. This is something that uh, uh, head coach Todd Dagenet was talking to me about in the preseason about how he wanted to get the sort of you know in Florida you know Florida school tournament going. Um, between UCF and three other schools in the state, so uh, this is this is what this is what's come to it. They're going to start at Fort Myers, Florida Gulf Coast is the host. The Knights are going to play Florida Atlantic at 10 a.m. on Friday. Then Florida Gulf Coast, the host team, at 7 p.m. At, on Friday, and then they finish up with Miami at 1:30 p.m. on Saturday. So big uh, uh, hope. I, I was going to say home. It's not really a home weekend, but I guess when you're back in the state of Florida from out in Colorado, uh, that'll certainly that'll certainly be a boost. But um, but yeah, another uh, it's it's going to be a bit another tough road trip for UCF volleyball before they have their first home match. We're still counting down to that, which is going to be in two weeks uh, on September the fifteenth. So, um, but if they can get a couple wins or maybe even three wins at the Sunshine State Challenge. That'd be big for uh, UCF volleyball as well. So keep an eye on that. We will be keeping an eye on it for you. All right, Elo. So as we uh, wrap up here on the Black and Gold Banneret podcast, what do you have coming up this week? Well, I will be at the UCF football game against FIU. I'll be on. Obviously, you can follow me on Eric Lopez Elo. But also, uh, I will try uh, to do a little Facebook live from the game. I might do some. Uh, some Facebook Live, kind of some atmosphere stuff. We did that a little bit, Jeff, actually, mm-hmm. after the women's soccer game, a little celebration. We're kind of experimenting with some of those things. So I'll be there. But then during the game, I'll be actually working official stats for CBS Sports Network. So you won't hear me talk on Twitter or do much about the game during the game because I'll actually be working part of the uh, CBS Sports Network crew, which I'm excited about. Um, I think that'll be a good broadcast there. Looking forward to it. Uh, Aaron Murray, by the way, yeah. former Georgia Bulldog quarterback who was the quarterback for Georgia by the way I don't know if I'll bring this up but I'm sure somebody will in that press box was the quarterback for Georgia if you remember Jeff when UCF beat Georgia in the Liberty Bowl that's right Aaron Uh, Murray from uh originally from Tampa exactly yeah so you're right so uh he'll be part of the broadcast Tina Servas will be down on the sideline uh Sean Grande who's the radio voice of the Boston Celtics uh who's also done some football does some MMA stuff he's pretty cool guy We'll be doing the play-by-play, so I'm looking forward to meeting him for the first time and Aaron Murray as well. So I'll be uh, doing official stats. So when you watch the broadcast and you see all these graphics with numbers and stats, uh, well, I'm the one that's giving them – I'm kind of inputting the – I'm giving them the numbers uh, to the truck and the guys in the truck who uh, do all the work. Uh, they just make the graphics. So that I'm looking forward to that. I've always enjoyed doing that. And uh, so I'll be doing that on a Thursday night. Uh, obviously, I'll be during the game and then uh, hopefully get some post game audio for our next week's show. Aaron Murray, I got a nice little, I got a fun little trivia bit for you. He is Georgia's all time record holder in the following categories most touchdown passes in a season and a career, 
most passing yards in a season and a career, most pass completions in a career, and highest pass efficiency rating for a season and for a career. Not bad. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not bad at all. So it, it'll be fun. I, I, I think it'll be, he should be a, he was a, he was certainly an excellent media presence in Georgia uh, when he was the quarterback there. So I think he'll be he'll fit in quite nicely on TV. So doing the game and and Sean Grandy is uh, an excellent play by play guy uh, and has been for a long time. So that should be fun. Good good to see those guys coming up on CBS Sportsnet. One thing I wanted to uh, also mention, of course, we will be live blogging the game. All right, we're going to do a little experiment this um, this week here in week one uh myself and uh and our uh and our resident editor uh and knower of many many things uh, uh brian murphy we will be live blogging the game right here on black and gold com. okay so uh make sure you log in and we'll basically be carrying on a conversation brian will be i believe he will be at the game right eric so um, he'll be there. That's correct. The I, Murph is back. He's back, right? So I will not be. I'll be watching the game on TV. But we'll be. You're that guy. You're that guy. Yeah, You're I'm that. that guy. Guy. <laughs> uh, but we'll be um, live blogging the game from kickoff all the way to the final gun, and trying to provide a little analysis as things go. So make sure you check that out at blackandgoldbanneret.com. I'm going to throw a link up there to our fa- uh, on our Facebook page. Uh, as well as it'll be the first thing you see on our on our site, uh, and uh, and we'll be tweeting at tweeting that out as well. So make sure you follow that. Um, should be fun. Uh, we never tried it before, so we're probably going to mess it up a few times, but that's okay because we're trying it. So uh, make sure you're on the lookout for that, and make sure you follow us as always at blackandgoldbanneret.com. Uh, as well as on our Facebook page, which you can just search for Black and Gold Banneret, and we're there. Uh, and also on Twitter, UCF underscore Banneret. I'm at Jeff underscore Sharon. Eric Lopez is at? Eric Lopez Elo. All right. And uh, don't forget to, again, if you haven't already, please subscribe to us, rate us, send us some questions, whatever you want to do. You can uh, you can rate us on iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and tune in uh, as well. So as we wrap up here, Eric Lopez, enjoy the game. Uh, say hi to Aaron Murray for for us because uh, why well, you know I never got to cover him at Georgia but a uh, couple but a couple of folks that I know did so they had nothing but high ratings for him you know when he was there so that should be a lot of fun enjoy the game Eric we'll do sir we'll do all right and thank you as always for listening this has been the Black and Gold Banneret podcast we will catch you next week. <laughs>